Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. I could not be more grateful to the um, Italian presidency for bringing us uh, together today and starting us with uh, Professor Nord Nordhaus' presentation. For the benefit of full disclosure, I am a trained environmental economist. I have been studying uh, your uh, research and I think it will show in what I have to say uh, right now. So where do we start? We have to keep global temperatures below rising 1.5 to 2% level. To get to that point, we have to cut global emissions by one quarter to one half over the next decade. Based on our historical experience, as we saw in the slides, this may seem an impossible target, but it is one we ought to and we can achieve with public support, technological breakthroughs, and yes, the right policies. Uh, our miserable performance so far has given ground to an interesting uh, a joke. How can we achieve sustainability and move protect our climate? And the answer is there are two ways to do that. One is realistic and the other one is fantastic. The realistic way is extraterrestrials comes from space, they take over our affairs, they do it. And the fantastic is we people, we do it ourselves. So your job as a presidency is to make the fantastic realistic. And we are here to help you do so. Why I think there is a pathway forward? First, because public awareness has gone up significantly. Recent global poll tells us that majority of people surveyed consider climate change a global emergency with the level of concern highest in small island and developing states and in high income countries at 74 and 72 percent accordingly, and well above 50 percent of people in middle income and least developed countries also believe this is the case, 62 and 58 percent. Another poll tells us that during the pandemic, this concern has gone up, and actually many of us worried it would be the opposite but actually people saw the pandemic as a reminder that we need to step up climate action. 43% of people surveyed recently said we are more concerned now. Only 7% said we are less concerned. We also have seen during the pandemic the response of science being so powerful. Uh, we got vaccines in record times, we saw the response of policymakers being unprecedented in terms of fiscal and monetary policy action. And it is in this context, uh, staff from several institutions came together and we worked on key policy priorities to cut emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. And actually, I agree with Professor Nord Nordhaus it has to go beyond the Paris Agreement if we were uh, to protect ourselves from being literally not, not, ver not uh, 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 well, basically being literally cooked. Uh, so first priority, and I would echo what we just heard, make market signals work for the new climate economy, not against it. As politically challenging this may be, the world needs to get rid of all forms of fossil fuel subsidies. And if we define them broadly, not only direct subsidies, but also undercharging for supplies, environmental and health costs, they are equivalent to more than $5 trillion annually. And we are coming up with new re research that would um, present the exact composition of these uh, sub subsidies. And obviously, key is what we just heard from Professor Nordhaus, 
to put a robust price on carbon, uh, as we actually discussed also at the tax uh, symposium. To create that critical signal to re redirect private investment and innovation to clean technology to incentivize energy efficiency. And our research is very clear. We simply cannot reach our goal of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius without carbon price. And this signal needs to be predictably getting stronger, reaching by 2030 an average global price of $75 a ton. Way up from where we are, and actually, uh, Professor Nordhaus, a little piece of good news. We'd increase coverage from 18 to 23 percent of carbon emissions that are priced. Uh, it went from $2 a ton to $3 a ton. Now, we can say, hooray, 50 percent higher, or we can say, well, that is 25 times slower than it should be by 2030. A minimal first step on carbon pricing is a regular stock taking of measures by the G20 countries to assess progress towards mitigation commitments. But we do believe we have to achieve a higher level of ambition, and you have heard me talking about that, introducing an international carbon price floor agreement among major emitters. It is very much in line with the, with the price club uh, we just heard about what the difference is that what it presents is an opportunity to calibrate four different categories of countries where the carbon price floor is now and how we go up. And I do believe that, that uh, emerging markets, developing countries would not join unless there is this recognition that we are not equal, either by contribution to the problem or by the way we get out of it. With a pragmatic design, this type of arrangement would allow different minimum prices based on different development levels and different national policy approaches. And the carbon price floor does not have to be a tax. It could be cap and trade, uh, or it could be even a combination of fee base and regulations that produce the equivalency of that carbon price uh, at uh, sectoral and national level. And crucially, as we are making global mitigation efforts more effective, this price floor would address concerns about competitiveness that are already insensitizing carbon border adjustments. In our view, they are less effective and more divisive. But carbon pricing alone is not enough. It brings me to the second policy priority, green investments. Radically decarbonizing our economies will require a substantial scaling up of investments over the next two decades. The shift to renewables, new electricity networks, energy efficiency, low carbon mobility offers huge investment opportunities and a huge opportunity for green growth and green jobs. Our research shows that Deficit finance green supply policies could raise global GDP by about 2% this decade and create millions of new jobs. On average, around 30% of new investments have to come from public sources, the remaining 70% from private sources. And that means giving priority to green recovery packages, green budgeting, and green finance. And of course, international institutions have a role to play to reduce both, both costs and perceived risks. Uh, and I know that uh, David would talk about it, so I would skip uh, and go straight to the third priority. Uh, Professor Norhaus didn't talk about it, but I will. And it is just transition within countries and across countries. Within countries, we must recognize decarbonization will impact vulnerable households, poor people, as well as businesses and workers currently deployed in sectors with high emissions. Fair compensation measures will be required. Uh, for example, revenues from carbon pricing could fund cash transfers, social safety nets, worker retraining, relocation schemes. And place-based policies can help develop new low-carbon industries and jobs through green investments. 
and across countries, we have to recognize we need to help the developing world. And this 100 billion a year that we're talking about, they must happen. And if they don't happen, there would be not only loss in momentum, but loss of trust, erosion of trust. And then these agreements that we talk about, they would be much harder uh, to reach. Let me finish with us at the fund. We work very closely with partners on this agenda. We've, with the bank, we formed a high-level advisory group on sustainable and inclusive development for policy analysis and proposals, concrete proposals down to country level uh, to move the world forward. We are putting climate at the heart of our work from country, regional, and global economic surveillance to capacity building to helping small island sta states with fiscal strategies that build resilience our board gave us a hand to cover climate in Article 4 and financial sector assessment programs. We would do it, mitigation for lar large emitters, adaptation uh, for vulnerable countries, and of course, transition for countries with high um, carbon intensity economies. Uh, and earlier this year, we launched the new cl climate change indicator dashboard. We very much embrace the data gap, gap initiative because good data lead to good uh, policies. Now, beyond surveillance, uh, uh, you would say, put your money where your mouth is. And what we are now working on is considering with our membership whether uh, the 650 billions of special drawing rights can give us an opportunity to move more financing in the right direction. We are exploring the creation of resilience and sustainability trust to support resilient and sustainable growth in the post-pandemic period, including resilience to climate change, lending at cheaper rates and longer maturities to provide fiscal space for countries to undertake green reforms and policies. And it could especially for a benefit low-income countries, poorer and vulnerable middle-income countries. And I look forward to discussing this with you. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, since you talk about Venice, Leonardo da Vinci, who worked in Venice, said, I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. And I think uh, today, hopefully, we get this sense of, yes, we can. Uh, and to prove uh, Professor Nordhaus' graph wrong, because it is going to turn the way you describe it, it should. Thank you very much.